Hello, I'm Lily Bellman, and I'm one of the clinical faculty members in pediatric emergency medicine and emergency ultrasound at Harbor UCLA. Thank you for tuning in to our Hips Don't Lie, Hip Ultrasound in the Evaluation of the Limping Child presentation. I'm joined by my colleague, William White. Hi there, my name is William White. I'm currently a fellow in ultrasound and pediatric emergency medicine at Harbor UCLA. Today, we'd like to state that we have no financial disclosures for you. Our objectives for this talk are to introduce you to the indications for hip point of care ultrasound in children, to then recognize the findings and some of the pitfalls in interpreting these pictures, and finally to understand some of the evidence behind using hip POCUS. We've all had this case. A four-year-old boy refusing to walk was fine yesterday. Parents brought him in stating there's no witness trauma, there's no obvious redness or swelling. They maybe felt warm yesterday with some subjective, subjective history of fevers, but otherwise not a whole lot to work on. Oh, and by the way, he had a URI last week. That brings us to the differential of the limping child in the emergency department. Something that is vast and sometimes very challenging, even to the seasoned provider. To help us tackle this problem of the broad differential for the limping child, we've borrowed the differential generation tool from the pediatric emergency playbook for stop limping. The expanded form of this differential includes lots of possibilities. The infected septic joint, the toddler's fracture, osteomyelitis of the hip, Perthes disease, possibly even limb length discrepancy, inflammatory syndromes, including possible transient synovitis, malignancies, pyomyositis, and the hidden iliopsoas abscess, and even some zebras such as neurologic GI or GU causes. The concerning can't miss diagnosis in the pediatric emergency department is the septic hip. The reason for this is this patient requires urgent orthopedic evaluation and often operative washout of their joint. The big challenge for the clinical provider, however, is that the septic joint can appear very similar to the inflammatory transient synovitis, often presenting some challenges to how to differentiate the two. In addition to that, there are many other possible things that need to be thoroughly evaluated and thought about in the emergency department. So when faced with all of this uncertainty, we have to ask ourselves, what should we do? Well, what can we do? We have a lot of possibilities here. Beyond the history and physical, there's a broad slew of laboratory and radiologic evaluation. But today, we're going to help you focus that by adding a new tool to your toolbox, bedside ultrasound of the hip. Here are some of the ways that we think about integrating the various pieces of information into our decision making. The history and physical provides quite a bit of information for parts of the differential. Imaging can provide a significant amount to help you out classically. And finally, labs can help you rule out very specific aspects. However, the septic joint and the transient synovitis, along with a few of the other kind of zebra diagnoses, fit into an area where the synthesis of the history and physical, the imaging, and the labs are really important. Our goal here today is to introduce you to how you can use hip bedside ultrasound to make this decision. To do this, we have proposed this algorithm. When you're doing bedside ultrasound of the hip, your main goal is to evaluate for the presence or absence of an effusion in the hip. The question is, if you find that effusion or you don't, what do you do? So refer back to this algorithm. When there is no effusion, the bedside ultrasound is less helpful in that it doesn't completely rule out a septic arthritis, but potentially points more to a different possible cause. You have to then keep your differential and your workup still very broad. However, when you find an effusion of the hip, this helps you narrow your differential, namely in the picture of septic arthritis versus synovitis. It's also possible of Perth's disease. Um, what we're going to talk about here is that then you have to use your Coker criteria to determine if the patient is high or low risk for a possible septic joint. If they're high risk, then they need an arthrocentesis and an orthopedic evaluation. Ultrasound guidance is possible in a bedside procedure for an arthrocentesis of the hip, but that's not going to be something we're talking about today. 
stay tuned for maybe next time. And if the patient is low risk by their COCR criteria, you think about them more of a transient synovitis type patient. Symptom control and appropriate follow-up to make sure that they resolve appropriately. And now, what you've been wanting to hear from me. How do we do this scan? First, I want to review the hip anatomy that's relevant here. On the left, we have a nice old Gray's Anatomy image showing us the pelvis and the femur and the joint capsule surrounding the hip joint. Here in the middle, I like this schematic which shows some of the base muscles and how they insert into the femur, and this is the area that we're going to be looking at. On the right, you see the iliopsoas muscle inserting into the femur, and this area, the potential space between the muscle and the bone, is where the hip joint lies and what we will be looking at on ultrasound. Here, the little blue box shows you the area that we're going to be scanning. For probe selection, for your younger patients who are smaller, the linear probe should be able to show you this area of anatomy. For larger patients and adults, you will use a curvilinear probe. The positioning is very important and requires the child to be in somewhat of a frog-legged position. You can put them in the pa parent's lap or somewhat supine. You may need to prop up the knees just a little bit with some towels. To image the hip, you want to place the probe lined up with the anatomical position of the femoral neck. On surface anatomy, you can do this by starting perpendicular to the inguinal crease. You may have to rotate the probe a little bit until you're lined up well with the femoral neck. During the scan, your probe marker should be placed towards the umbilicus. The image that you'll generate, regardless of which side you will be on, will always show the femoral head on the left side of the screen and then the distal femur on the right side of the screen. Now I'll walk you through what a normal hip should look like and the important structures to identify. First, I'm highlighting the head of the femur going into the femoral neck. Then I'll highlight the iliopsoas muscle. And finally, the joint space, which in a normal hip may have a small amount of physiologic fluid or can just appear as a potential space. Here is an example of, on the left side of the screen, a normal appearing hip, and on the right side of the screen, a hip with an effusion. I want to draw your eyes primarily to the contour that the joint space takes in the normal case or in the abnormal case. On the left, you see a concave border of the hip joint in the normal circumstance, and on the right, you can see that the extra fluid builds up under the joint capsule and causes the joint capsule to have a convex appearance. You can measure the anterior synovial space, which is the anechoic area under the joint capsule, and compare both sides. A joint effusion is defined in the pediatric population as that area greater than 5 millimeters, and in adults greater than 7 millimeters. In both adults and pediatric patients, a difference of greater than two millimeters between sides is also diagnostic of an effusion. One potential pitfall of this type of imaging is mistaking the articular cartilage for an effusion. In this image here, you can see the uh, a hypoechoic area around the femoral head labeled by the letters AC but you'll also notice that it doesn't really extend past the femoral head. A true joint effusion should extend beyond the femoral head and should also create that convex appearance of the joint space. I know you want to know, well, how good are these tests? Luckily, we have some good studies that demonstrate fairly good test performance. Vieira et al. in 2010 in Boston asked the question of can pediatric emergency providers identify hip effusions in children with limp? This was a prospective study of 28 children and 55 hips in which an emergency provider, these were all the pediatric emergency docs at Boston Children's, 
uh, and comparing their scan against a radiology performed study. In addition to logging their interpretation of effusion or no, they also rated their confidence in their findings. Among those who rated themselves with their highest confidence, the emergency physician study showed a sensitivity of 90% and a specificity of 100% compared to the radiology scans. When considering all of the studies, even with the lower confidence, they still showed a fairly high sensitivity of about 85%. Of note, the physicians performing these studies received fairly limited training of doing about 10 of these scans and having a 30-minute didactic. Interestingly, in the field of POCUS research, it turns out that a large retrospective study is probably the strongest evidence that we have in support of using POCUS for hips. In 2017, Cruz et al. at Boston queried their full ultrasound POCUS database and their quality assurance information. They found 516 children and 926 hips that had been studied. They compared the interpretation of the scan by whoever was performing it to the interpretation of the reviewing POCUS expert. They found a sensitivity of 85% and specificity of 98%. They also noted that a given sonographer over time showed increasing, improving in their uh, test performance. So with all that in mind, let's revisit the case from earlier. The patient had a bedside ultrasound showing the following pictures. On the left, we see a normal appearing hip, and on the right, we see what appears to be an effusion. This brings us back to our algorithm. So in this case, the patient had an effusion on bedside ultrasound. So this takes us down towards the left side, where we think this is possibly either septic arthritis versus transient synovitis. What we can see here is the results of the data of the patient's emergency department visit. He remained afebrile, his white count, ESR, and CRP were within normal limits for our laboratory. What this does is it places him in the low-risk Coker criteria, making us suspect that even though he had a significant joint effusion, that we determined that he had transient synovitis. After some ibuprofen, the patient was running around the department looking well. He made a full recovery. Here we present a recipe card for you to do your own bedside hip ultrasounds. When selecting your probe, pick the linear or the curvilinear probe, depending on the size of the footprint needed for the scan. For positioning the patient, place them in either a supine position or in the parent's lap in a slight frog leg position. For the scan itself, the probe is placed parallel to the femoral neck with the marker placed towards the umbilicus. Identify on the ultrasound the femoral head and neck, and then anteriorly the iliopsoas muscle with the joint space between. Measure the anterior synovial space, the anechoic space deep to the joint capsule. Make sure to scan both hips as you need to compare the affected and unaffected sides. For your results, an abnormal finding is a joint capsule anechoic space of greater than 5 millimeters in pediatric patients and greater than 7 millimeters in adult patients, or a difference of 2 millimeters or more between the two sides in the same patient. Additionally, when you're evaluating the space, a joint effusion will create a convex appearance, whereas a normal appearing joint will have a concave appearance. Some of the pitfalls you may face are that if you press too hard, you may obliterate a small effusion, causing a false negative study. Additionally, you may accidentally identify the articular cartilage as an effusion, causing a false positive study. Remember that a true effusion will cross the femoral head and extend distally. These are the references we talked about in today's talk. Thank you for giving us your time and joining us today. Unfortunately, with this format and given the circumstances, we can't take any real-time questions. However, we're both open to hearing from you. So please, if you have any questions, thoughts, comments, or even just great stories about bedside ultrasounds of hips, please feel free to reach out to us. We hope you've ins we've inspired you to consider adding POCUS of the hip to your POCUS arsenal.
Happy scanning.